want to um, kind of set up the topic and begin the conversation. We have uh, people still logging in, but I think at this point, we're probably at eight minutes in the hour, uh, should get going. Jennifer, right would you like to, why don't you start? Okay, well, um, this topic uh, grew out of my own frustration. Um, when I uh, started uh, running Quantum Touch, uh, I believed that if you do what you love, the money will follow. And that wasn't the case. I did what I love. I followed my heart and I uh, got myself into major financial trouble. Um, can anyone else relate to that? Or was I the only one? Just like show of hands, right? So uh, yeah, um, so that seems to be a common issue. I, I noticed other people- Chat is lighting up, it, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, so it seems to be, you know, a common issue that I've noticed with healers and coaches and other people that are that are following their heart and, and doing this practice that they love is their financial situation is is not feeling abundant. And uh, I got really frustrated too because I believed in the law of attraction. I believe that you know we we create our reality. And I was doing the affirmations. I was you know envisioning abundance and. Uh, didn't seem to work. And I'm like, what's wrong with the law of attraction? You know, why isn't this working? And so this whole thing grew out of my own frustration with, you know, I was teaching people, yes, you can use the law of attraction for your own healing. And yet we weren't being able to use it for money. And that was again, um, part of my frustration. So, uh, I was, I was angry at God. I was angry at the universe. I was thinking of getting a normal job again. And, uh, the good news is, is that, um, I went from having, uh, over like maybe, uh, let's see how much, $135,000 of debt, uh, credit card and otherwise to zeroing that out. And, um, now I actually have, uh, uh a, a bunch of money saved and a bunch of money invested and, uh, I'm building a home. And so I turned it around and, uh, and, um, so I believe like if I could do it, anyone can do it because I don't have much discipline. So, uh, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not very frugal. I don't like frugality. I like to eat out. I like to do all kinds of stuff. So I feel like if I can do it, anyone can do it because uh, I'm not the most disciplined person. So anyways, that's, that's just a little background about, you know, why I'm really passionate about this topic. And, um, and uh, I'd um, go ahead and I'd like to hear from Dan, just a little background on, on him. Oh, and Dan's on mute. Um, you can unmute Dan. Oh, thank you, Jennifer. Yes, thank you, Jennifer, go. for your uh, background and your honesty and openness. Yeah, I don't want, you know, we don't want people to imagine that somehow Jennifer is saying, look, we know all about this. No, actually, we've screwed it up a whole bunch of times. That's what our expertise is, okay? But we've learned from mucking around and, and, and you know, trying this and trying that. And, and the journey, of course, is always is an inward journey. You know, your relationship to abundance is primarily about your relationship with yourself. And I think from there to the universe, like Jennifer, I've had periods of, um, let's call it substantial poverty, if those two words can go together, extreme poverty, with um, not sure how I was going to feed my family and living in a little trailer. Uh, so I don't want you to think because Jennifer and I have, and we both do have now, some modicum of success and abundance, that it was always that way because what we've been learning to do over the years is crawl our way out of the assumptions and the misunderstandings that put us in poverty or kept us, make us broke or kept us in the negative side of the financial ledger. So I guess the background is, look, this, this is up to each of us. How we are with money, how we are with our careers, how we are with abundance generally is determined by our attitudes and our stories. I had a lot of negative stories about money and about myself and about the universe. And one of the, my primary stories was that I thought it was a very unfriendly universe. And of course, by projecting that and believing that to be true unconsciously at first, then consciously, that's what I experienced, an unfriendly universe, competitive, zero sum game. Some people are lucky, some people aren't. Some people are born with a silver spoon, some people aren't. I certainly wasn't, et cetera, et cetera. It was just a whole bunch of stories that when you step back from them a bit, don't make any sense and don't have to be true unless you're going to insist by repeating them in your mind chatter that they are true. So 
Jennifer I've, and I have come together and realized that our experiences around abundance are very, very similar. Different paths ending up in the same place. And that's why we put this, these webinars and this course together. And, you know, the first thing we want to start with is a higher purpose. It's intimately connected to your ability to be abundant. It's whether you're clear about your higher purpose, not because you're clear God or the goddess or whatever you believe in gives you money. It isn't that linear as Jennifer said, it isn't that simple. But the clearer you are about who you are and how you want to be, the easier it is for the universe to respond. And yeah, and there's a reference to Jennifer's book in chat. Um, and I invite you to think about this. Are you clear about who you are and what you want? And I don't mean in the sense of, I want a car, or I want a house, that's fine. But about what's your purpose in the world? Why are you on the planet? A good friend of mine defines a worthy, a higher purpose is finding a worthy field of play. Something where you feel completely fulfilled in what you do. Now you might say, well, Jennifer just said, do what you love and the money will follow. It's not quite that simple. And we're gonna break that down for you in a number of areas. And the bottom line here is higher purpose becomes a magnetic attractor rather than you becoming the magnetic attractor. And I just want you to think about that as, as, we, sp as we speak to all these categories. Anything you wanna add, Jennifer, on higher purpose? Yeah, you know, um, I have to admit, you know, when I discovered my higher purpose as energy medicine, along with that came a lot of frustration and anger at the universe because, uh, again, uh, I, I was, I thought I was doing what I was supposed to do and, and the money didn't come. And so, um, I, I invite you to not discount your higher purpose, uh, just because it may not be, uh, producing your income because, um, I believe that your higher purpose is also a path of growth and, uh, it's, it's your highest path of growth. So it's your highest joy and also your highest path of growth because uh, how many people out here have noticed that when you follow your dreams, you do a lot of growing, <laughs> at least me. Um, so, you know, having the courage to, to keep at it, you know, uh, it's tempting to go to think, um, I need to go get a real job again because, you know, I did fine when I wrote software. I hated my job, but the money was fine. So um, I invite people to kind of set that thinking aside and, and think, yeah, really embrace your higher purpose and um, let it be uh, like I had to embrace it as a path of, of growth for me as well, not just uh, butterflies and rainbows, which I thought it would be, but it, it didn't start like that. Thank you, Jennifer. It's really true. It's true for me and true for many of the people I work with. You have to do the work. If you've got barnacles over your heart, disconnecting you from the infinite, right? If you've got serious childhood uh, emotional wounds typically, and you haven't yet got on with healing them, it's hard to be abundant. It's hard to let the flows of what I believe to be a truly abundant universe in if you're blocking them out from your own pain and your own grief as yet unresolved. So we can't have it both ways in my view, right? You can't say, oh, I want to be abundant, but I'm not going to do any of the work. I just want to be abundant because I'm a good person and I'm doing work to help other people. You know, my highest purpose is to teach meditation. Well, it's kind of hard to make a living teaching meditation, right? Except now, years later, I've constructed a business model that pays me to meditate and to help others meditate and to apply it in their businesses, etc. So you can get there, right? But I have done a lot of growth. I have lots more growth to go. I'm not sure it ever ends folks, there uh, was no golden rainbow there, but it's directly proportional to pick up what Jennifer's saying to add some texture. The more I grow, the more I let abundance leak into my life. Now, of course, I'm working on a premise, on a premise that you may or may not believe or experience yet, which is that it is truly an abundant universe. I'm just keeping it out of my experience. I'm working hard and putting a lot of unconscious energy into holding that abundant flow away from me without meaning to, of course. And then when you get into blame, look out. It's God's fault, that's a good one, or the goddess, right? The universe, other people's fault, my parents' fault, right? Society's fault, politicians. You can blame all you want, but it's not gonna help you. And I'm not saying people don't have their own responsibilities for how they live and how they act, they do, but so do you. So I more or less have given up on blaming because it didn't help. 
and it didn't help me become abundant. And I've taken responsibility for my own attitude, including my approach to my higher purpose. And I think that's the next thing we want to go to, Jennifer, is the attitude about abundance and scarcity. Most of us carry in our culture a deep scarcity belief. It triggers the amygdala and it figures, triggers fight and flight, right? And we have this underlying sort of societal trained, oh my God, what if I don't have enough money? What if my family doesn't have money? And COVID has just made that harder and worse. But there's a scarcity thing that runs through all our culture, not all cultures, but our culture that we're constantly having to work with. I wonder if you want to speak to scarcity uh, attitude, Jennifer. Yeah, so um, the, the module two that we're going to cover in our longer course is abundance versus scarcity. And this topic is really near and dear to my heart because um, I had a big wake up call around this. It wasn't just a meditation under a tree. Um, I describe this wake up call in my book. Um, I, I, the wake up call happened uh, in the back of a police car, actually, of all places. Um, and uh, it, it, was, uh, it was a really traumatic event that happened in my life. And um, I got to this point where I, I explain this a lot in my book, but I got to this point where um, I realized that the biggest issue that I was having with everything in my life, you know, abundance and, and, and men and, uh, you know, my health and, and, and you name it, there was, there was one underlying theme. And that was that I felt like a victim overall. Like I felt like a victim to all the men I was dating who were unavailable. I felt like a victim to my cause. You know, I felt like a victim to quantum touch. I felt like, wow, I'm, I'm sacrificing myself to, to make this business happen. So I felt like a martyr and a victim. And uh, I, I was blaming the universe for, for my problems. You know, I, I thought, well, you know, if I'm opening my heart and trying to help others, I should be taken care of. And I mean, how many people feel like, does anyone else feel like a, a victim or, or feel like the, the universe kind of is maybe not being nice to them when they're helping others? Uh, any, anyone out there? Or is that was just, you know, my thing? Or, uh, you know, I, I, I blame, you know, I, I was easily going into blame. Um, Hello. So that was my biggest, uh, my biggest wake up call no, no, I'm was uh, Brad, feeling like a victim. Please mute that person. Yeah. Yeah. So we got some people here. Yes. I used to feel like I did years back. And uh, so I feel like as long as that if there's any part of you that's uh, doing martyr or victim or, or feeling, um, yeah, that it always happens to me and only me. Uh, I got one comment there. Um, that's the, uh, I noticed that that's the antith antithesis of abundance. So like victim and abundance don't go together. And um, yeah, some people are identifying with this, you know, and I, I think we're all working through this as healers, right? I, I don't think I'm fully complete because there are days where I still like to go into blame, you know, blaming something because it feels better than, than trying to own it. Um, but I think it's, well, it seems like for a lot of people, it's becoming less and less of a factor, but um, been there, done that, still wearing the t-shirt. <laughs> yeah, I've been feeling like a uh, can be difficult at times, right? It, it, healing work can be difficult. Um, yes. So whenever we, we have these victim-y thoughts, it's like we're projecting this energy that keeps us from abundance. So it's just something to pay attention to. And I'm, I'm sure that we've all done a lot of work around it. I certainly have, you know, and, and I still have my days, but uh, big wake up call for me. So that's, uh, Thank Dan, you, I don't know if you had a comment Thank you, on Jennifer. that. Yeah, my, uh, my wake up moment was a moment where we were, my family was in poverty and I almost stole food from my stepdaughter. I just literally had my hand out. Some would call it, if you know the reference, the Jean Valjean moment. It was like, literally, you know, you know, we weren't starving. She was just eating a lot of potatoes and I wanted to get her something different, but I didn't. Thank God I didn't do that. Who knows what that would have led to. And then when I was coming back from that store, walking back to, to a little trailer park in my little trailer, I suddenly had this realization that leaving that aside, that 
I'd rather my daughter had better food to eat, my stepdaughter. I was totally happy. I had just a shirt on my back. Now, okay, a little trailer and $32 in my pocket, but just a shirt. I was totally, totally happy. And I thought, well, wait a minute, if I can be happy with just a shirt on my back and living in a little trailer camp, what am I worried about? What am I? What is all this need to acquire and get stuff and have something called security? And I just let it all go. And my relationship with money and career completely changed in that moment. Now, I've still had to work it and figure out what that means over the years and, you know, understand it. And I, like Jennifer, I fall back into victimhood and scarcity thinking. Uh, you know, I, I was an expert in self-pity, right? I've got my PhD in self-pity and I really had to let that one go. I really had to heal that one, right, and become... I'm much more aware of my own responsibilities. Anyway, the next topic we will cover in our seminar will be in our in our, our seminar that's after this is intentionality and goal setting. And this turns out to be a critical part of moving from scarcity to abundance. And Jennifer, I wonder if you want to highlight that. So one of my challenges with goal setting is that it seems like there's two camps. And one is uh, the law of attraction. And, and just letting your goal go, like just setting an intent and, and letting it go. And the other one is um, more of the traditional goals, goal setting, which is like smart goals, which is like very linear type of goal setting where you have timelines and like specific dollar amounts and um, you create like a linear process to achieve your goals. So one is magic, a law of attraction. I just set the intent, let it go and the universe delivers. The other is linear, like logic. And, and I always have this little bit of a struggle between how logical do I need to be versus how magical can I be? And I go back and forth between magic, logic, magic, logic, and, and, and I just get really, really confused. So in, um, I've learned how to integrate the two and uh, set goals specific enough so you can accomplish them, but allow space for magic as well. So you can integrate magic and logic together. And um, that's the topic that we're gonna explore is how do you really integrate the law of attraction with traditional goal setting? And, um, cause you know, here's what I've seen. Uh, people set these, these goals. Like I, I'd like to have a uh, million dollars next year. And the goal seems completely like, well, I don't really believe that that goal is, is real. Um, I know I've done that. I've, I've said, ah, I'd like, I'd like a million dollars, but I don't really believe that I'll have a million dollars. So that goal, it, it never gets achieved. And uh, whereas, you know, I set these little tiny goals, like I'd like uh, to have one more client or, or something like that. Um, but those goals don't seem as exciting or interesting. So anyways, I, I we're going to explore that push and pull between like the magical thinking and, and the linear goal setting and kind of where's that intersection point? Uh, yeah, Jen, Jen, Jennifer and Dan, uh, I just wanted to interject. We're, we're getting a lot of comments in the chat. People are asking for uh, what's the name of your book? Is there a link? Um, you know, uh, we have people uh, just for reference from uh, over 30 different countries who have registered for today's event. So uh, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, just to uh, take a moment to talk about um, what uh, we're doing uh, kind of in the wake of this uh, introduction to the topic of the energy of abundance. We have a seven week uh, course program that's gonna be a one hour uh, per week um, event with a much smaller group. Uh, and that is going to essentially be a deep dive uh, into the uh, topics that we're summarizing today. Uh, it's gonna be an environment uh, where there's a lot of interaction, there's conversation, uh, again, smaller groups, and uh, we will be um, posting links to um, where you can learn more about Dan and Jennifer, about their books, about their background, uh, and about this uh, seven-week course program that we're offering. Uh, and we will be uh, putting those links up with a um, kind of early bird pricing uh, for anybody that might like to sign up uh, by Friday of this week. And just for reference, there's a $245 regular price for the seven-week program that will be available for 196 for um, you know, early bird uh, signups. And with that said, uh, I, again, uh, appreciate all the chats, all of your questions uh, we will answer. Uh, we've got your email contact information from registration. So we will give you uh, everything you're asking for and more. 
uh, immediately after this uh, webinar concludes. And with that said, back to you, Jennifer and Dan. Thank you, Brad. And um, just to emphasize what Jennifer was saying, you can undermine your goals by your beliefs. Just she said, oh, you want a million dollars, great. Pretty arbitrary goal, has some juice on it, exciting, but if you really don't believe it's not gonna happen. Incremental goals are better, they're more realistic, right? There's another side of this to goal setting, which is, you, sh you know, it works best, it seems, to set goals in how you wanna feel. Not a million dollars, but how you wanna feel when you have a million dollars, or if you want a new client, how are you gonna feel when you get that new client? The universe seems to respond better <clears throat> for reasons perhaps they don't understand yet, is what do you want to feel? How's your soul going to feel? How's your heart going to feel? How's your being going to light up when? So as opposed to just wanting a house, how do you family, how are you and your family going to feel when you have that house? As opposed to, you know, kind of the surface of things go a little deeper in your manifesting when you set your goals. And of course, we'll dive into this in the course. There's a very particular way that we found works to set what I call essence goals and then let go. Yes, yeah, somebody said that. Let go of that when you give it over to the universe. And we'll get into this sort of a five-step and what I call conscious manifesting process that has worked pretty well for me over the years and, and for other people. Jennifer, let's move on to um, a really interesting concept that <clears throat> you and I have been talking about for a while now, uh, which is the idea of your business or your career as a living being. Now, what do we mean by that? You know, there's a new science, if you're not familiar with it, called the science of the biofield. You can look it up. Um, and the biofield is really scientists finally coming to be able to measure human energy fields. Ancients have been talking about them for thousands of years. It's not a new concept. If you're an energy healer, you know this, or if you go to an energy healer. But they're beginning to be able to measure this now. And <clears throat> what we've figured out over time, wait a minute, is that if I have an energy field and you have an energy field, we have a shared energy field when we're working together, even on Zoom. Now, wait a minute, if I have an energy field and I have a few people in my business, we have a shared energy field. Even if I just have a business on my own and I'm a sole practitioner, which many energy healers are, there's an energy that develops around the intentionality of your business. Um, and just for fun, I like to call it a creature, just to get people's attention because it seems to be organic and alive and real. And most exciting, what I've discovered over the past few years is you can communicate with that energy a biofield, so to speak, of your business or your organization. And when you do, your syntax changes. Instead of always saying, what should I do next? Or if there's a few of you or a company, what should we do next? Of course, you can ask that question. You also ask, what wants to emerge next? That's a very different question. It's treating the notion that everything is alive, everything is sentient as a real possibility, including your own business, your own organization or even your own career. So Jennifer, my language is a little bit different than yours on that, but I wonder if you want to comment on this idea of an organic something we're working with. Yeah, so uh, just as an example with quantum touch, quantum touch has its own energy and it's the collective energy of everyone involved and it has its own mission and it has its own vision, and it has its own path. And uh, I'm a facilitator of that, it's not me it's facilitating where the business wants to go. What I found really interesting is that if the business is going a certain direction, I'm resisting it because either I, I don't like change. I mean, I, I can be resistant to change sometimes, or I don't believe that, um, you know, I, I don't believe it's possible or, or things like that. Um, I noticed that the business kind of has its own free will and gets what it wants anyways, um, which is amazing. So, so you know, I, I just feel like going with the flow of what your business wants to do um, is really, really fascinating to me. I had a recent experience where um, my business wanted to go a certain direction and I was resisting it. Um, and uh, it got to the point where I'm like, oh my gosh, I, I just need to follow the flow of, of what, you know, what Quantum Touch wants to do. And, um, so I think really listening to your, your business and, and, and understanding like its own flow um, is really important. It, it's, it actually creates the highest good. And um, that's why we do healing work in, in the first place 
it, it creates the highest good for everyone involved. Like for quantum touch, when I follow the flow, it's the highest good for you know all the all the, everyone involved with it and um, the employees and the customers and the instructors. So it's it's a, it's really fascinating if you start really listening um, to your business. And hear what hear what Jennifer just said. Listen to your business. She didn't say listen to your own mind chatter. <laughs> we all do that all the time. But listen to your business, which takes a certain practice and detachment of what is the business, what is your own mind chatter, what is somebody else's chatter or thoughts. So it takes practice to be able to sit still and in your center and use your skills and be able to sense. I would submit that not only is quantum touch the collection of everybody's intentions, it's more than the sum of the parts. Right? It's, an, it's something more than that. It's an organization we're going for a number of years with a higher purpose and higher good, right? And so we just invite you to just consider the possibility. And of course, we'll dive into this more in the in the course that something is there that is more than just you and your ego and your thoughts. There's something more than that, and that's for me is a lot of fun to play with. And I've done it in a number of different businesses now, in a number of different organizations. And at first, you can imagine a typical business guy being startled when you say, well, have you been talking to your creature? And they go, what? What the hell are you talking about now? So you get into some really interesting conversations about, about now in business that might typically be represented by culture and emotional tone. So you can find words that are a little easier for you to, and your friends and colleagues to even get a little closer to this. But we're submitting that at the energetic level, especially for those that are if you, many of you are energy skilled, Use those skills, not just to help in healing, right? But to relate to what your life's work is and what you're trying to accomplish. Um, the next topic that we'll be diving into in the course is one of my favorite topics, which we call the art of inner marketing. So many years ago, um, when I decided I was tired of running other people's organizations, I decided to become a life coach. But I decided to do an experiment. I wanted to use energy principles in an experiment. So I never put up a website and I never did a business card. I, I'm not suggesting you do that, but that's what I was trying. And I just imagined my perfect first client and imagine her qualities. She'd be a tipping point connector. We would have a good experience together and she would become a source of referral for me and all my business would grow strictly on word of mouth, which I'm sure much of yours does, but just trusting that. And then calling my clients, future clients, into that energetically and just imagining them. And imagining the good time we were going to have in the learning and the healing they could go through perhaps with my help. And that happened 15 years ago and I never spent a dime on marketing. I never, it, it worked. And I was like, oh, well, that was easy. And now, depending on what's happening with the rest of my life and a couple other businesses I own, I turn my coaching up or down by just imagining that. Oh, I need some more clients. Oh, I don't we need so many clients. You might already do the same or you might do it subconsciously and I'm inviting you to do it consciously. Your impact, your state of being has a tremendous amount of impact on your clients. If you're worried during COVID, oh my God, how am I gonna find clients? And I used to do face-to-face -face and now I can't. You're sending worry out into the field, right? If you're going the other way and saying, I've gotta be virtual and virtual is okay and we're gonna work it and maybe I already did virtual and I'm gonna do more. So it goes. I've never been busier, luckily for me, during COVID. But part of that is my attitude and my approach. So think about this question of, yeah, okay, you can have a website and you can have a business card and you can pay some dollars for people to do those things. Some of us spend too much on that, by the way. But if it's not infused with your vibrancy in your life, it's going to be dead. What's important is you and your energy field and what you infuse. You can infuse artifacts like business cards and websites with your own energy, if you understand how to do that. Any comments, Jennifer, on the art of inner marketing? Yeah, I had a question for everyone. Uh, how many people have uh, forced themselves to do something they didn't want to do in the name of marketing and promotion? <laughs> how well has that worked out? <laughs> this was this is something that I learned the hard way. So I, I, I uh, studied uh, sales funnels, you know, and, and uh, I thought, okay, we have to do a sales funnel for quantum touch. It's the last thing I wanted to do. I had resistance every single step of the way. 
how well did that work out? It, it, it just, it, I spent a lot of money learning about sales funnels and doing sales funny, funnels and it, it just was a complete waste of money and time. And I realized that in the same way that if, if your heart is behind your healing work, it's going to be an amazing, you know, profession, right? If your heart is behind the way that you promote your business, it's going to be an amazing way to promote your business. If, if you don't like what you're doing to promote and it feels yucky or it, it doesn't feel good, it's not the right path. And, and, and when I finally accepted that and said, you know, because we're doing energy, it doesn't follow the traditional you know, business models of, of sales and marketing. How can it? it? It's working with energy and love. And uh, when I finally accepted that, yes, yeah, so as someone just said, if it doesn't feel good in your gut, it, it's, it's not the right path. When I finally just accepted that and said, okay, no longer going to force myself to do a sales funnel ever again. Felt good. Yeah, thank so you. So that's part uh, of the inner marketing. Listen to what you're saying, right? It felt good. And there's lots of chats here. Take a look at them where people are agreeing with that. If it doesn't feel good, not to your ego, but to your heart, don't do it. Or if you don't believe us, try it. It's not going to work. Some of you already did that, right? So you can keep trying. When we effort and will things, it's the wrong energy. I'm going to effort and will and manipulate people to come to my great website and my great story and my great photo. And, and then they're going to like me and pay me money. What? What's that got to do with energy healing and heart to heart and helping people grow? Nothing. Doesn't mean you can't have marketing materials in traditional sense that are aligned and represent you and feel right. But I remember a customer I had whose website didn't look and feel like her at all. Look, it felt like somebody else. She was trying to like put up her persona. Maybe somebody advised her. I don't know. And she wasn't getting any customers. And of course, because it wasn't her. It wasn't authentic. Part of this learning, of course, is the more you are who you really are, the more the universe responds to that. Yeah, and somebody just said, yeah, it feels awful and never goes anywhere. And, and you know, definition of madness to keep doing the same thing and think it's going to have a different result. Right? So what we're trying to show you here in this little sort of uh, opening session here and of course in the deeper course is that what else to do instead of the usual traditional things that don't often very work, work very well for us. Brad, did you want to make any more comments on what's coming up next? Yeah, um, I, you know, I've been seeing some uh, questions showing up in chat, you know, uh, can you share uh, more information on the background of Dan and Jennifer? Uh, I did put a link to uh, where everybody can learn about that. One thing that's um, important to know is, you know, Jennifer is the chief magical officer for Quantum Touch uh, marketing uh, sort of related uh, position. She knows what she's talking about when it, when it comes to marketing. Uh, Quantum Touch is a very successful organization uh, uh, worldwide uh, sort of, um, uh, you know, audience of people that are coming through their training programs. Dan is a, a life and business coach, uh, has a full calendar um, that where he does one-on-one -on -one consultation with many different clients all over the world. Um, the course that we're offering is, is going to be a very small group. In fact, we're, we're limiting the number of people to around 20 uh, who are going to be able to participate in that course. So this is a seven-week, seven-hour conversation space where you will be in that uh, virtual room with uh, Dan and Jennifer. Uh, there'll be plenty of uh, opportunity to ask questions. There are so many stories that Dan and Jennifer have to share, and so much experience that they're not going to be able to get into in one hour today. But uh, that's uh, why we designed this uh, seven-week course program uh, again, we'll be sharing more information um, uh, about that with you by email immediately after this event. Uh, I'll put a link in the, in the chat as well near the end of today. And um, the, the course series uh, starts, um, uh, it's going to be Wednesdays from 11 to 12 uh, Pacific time, Western, uh, essentially California time. And those dates are April 28th through June 9th. Again, uh, more information to follow by email. But uh, keep an eye out for that. And with that said, Dan and Jennifer, back to you guys. Yeah, just to, to, to pick up on the course, you know, there's a lot of wisdom on this call right here, not just Jennifer's experience and mine, your own. You all have many stories of things that have worked for you. Some of you are hinting or glimpsing at them in chat. 
And so in a small course with 20 people, you get to learn from what others have learned too and their struggles and their successes. There's a lot of wisdom right in this audience and we take advantage of that. It isn't just like Jennifer and I are the experts. We have had some success, but we also will facilitate who else has had successes and tell us what you learned from your struggles. So it's that kind of collaborative sharing and work together. Um, another one of my favorite topics, cash flow. Nothing defeats us more emotionally than cash flow. Oh my God, it's great. It's great. I got lots of money in the bank. Oh my God, it's horrible. It's horrible. I'm talking about myself, right? It's like up and down like a yo-yo, right? And if we can develop a different relationship with cash flow than yo-yo relationship because it can really destroy us in our businesses. You know, cash flow needs to be managed. Most of us don't even have what I call a simple cash flow management plan. We'll talk about how to do that. So it's a practical tool. But the important thing is not that. It's just a tool. Is your emotional relationship with money. A lot of people define how happy they are, how successful they are, how much money they have in the bank or they don't have in the bank, which is crazy. I work with a lot of high net worth people around the world. And some of them are the most miserable SOBs I've ever met in my life. And they're worth millions upon millions and millions of dollars. Well, so that kind of destroys the, well, if I just have money, I'll be happy theory of our culture, right? And I know people who are very poor and struggling, particularly during COVID, are some of the happiest people I know in the world. It's not about how much money you have in your bank. It's how you are in relationship to yourself, your community, and the universe. And of course, including how you relate to money. Money is meant to be just a means of exchange. Long before we pour our greed and our fear into it, which pollutes it, it's just a neutral means of exchange. A bunch of electrons used to be paper, used to be coins, used to be rocks, a means of exchange. But of course, it's not neutral for us because we pour fear and greed into it and measurement of success. So how we will explore together is, how do I manage my cash flow emotionally so they have detachment from it and I can plan for it. And sometimes it's as simple as, oh, every summer my business drops because people are on holidays. And, well, did you plan for that? And where's your contingency? And do you have a line of credit? And, oh, no, I didn't. Oh, that's like a really obvious thing you can miss because we get so uptight about money and cash flow. So, Jennifer, you might have some, I know you have experiences in cash flow. <laughs> um, my, uh, my ego used to be really wrapped up in money. Um, it's interesting that net worth is called net worth and not financial net worth. So my story used to be, look, I am, I'm such a loser. I got a hundred thousand dollars in debt. Gosh, what, what, how bad I'm not even a person. Um, I don't know if anyone else has had their ego really wrapped up in money. And then when I started, you know, paying off the debt and, and I had a hundred thousand saved, I'm like, look at me, look at how good of, how good I am. You know, I, I'm, I'm a good person now. Like I just, you know, I, I my ego was totally wrapped up in that. And uh, I realized that came from my upbringing where money and ego and like, uh, you know, patting on your back, the more money you had, the, the better you are, you know, that, that was really part of my upbringing. And so the, uh, the work that I've been doing on this is, is uh, letting go of the attachment, the ego attachment to my, my net worth. And I'm, I've been finding that it's easier to, uh, for money to go in and out and, and not worry about it because I don't, I don't get like, oh, no, now I'm a bad person because I lost 20000 this month. And, and now I'm a good person because I made 20000 this month. So, um, yes. Uh, <laughs> So anyways, um, that was part of, part of my learning edge. I don't know if, how, how many other people here have kind of wrap up their feelings and, and their money or is that just me or, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely a learning, a learning edge. Um, so, uh, our, our I'll take culture, it back to you. Thank you, Jennifer. Sorry to, to step on you. Our culture teaches us that we're supposed to define ourselves by our money. And that's just a terrible invasive thing. And happily that can be unlearned, but you can't just unlearn it by saying, I won't, don't wanna do that. You have to replace it with a better definition and sense of self. And of course I just put in chat, abundance is about so much more than money. Think of the rich people who are miserable or their kids in particular. Abundance is about love, 
and relationship and safety and place and sense of place. There's so many more things that if you define abundance as just money, of course it should include money. You're just narrowing your possibilities of what the universe wants to give you and what you can participate in. Now the next topic we'll be getting into in the seven week course is <clears throat> business tools as energy skills. And what we mean by that are, we don't need to throw out the old economy to create the new economy. We need to take the best out of the old economy which is based on greed and fear, of course, and bring it into the new economy, which is based on community and love and, and, and connectivity. You can think about it this way. Think about a spreadsheet. A spreadsheet is just an elegant, very simple tool. You don't have to not use a spreadsheet because everybody else in the business world does and are kind of obsessed with them, of course. But a spreadsheet can be very important to you as a tool for one simple reason, a spreadsheet, say on your cash flow or on your uh, profit and loss or whoever uses a spreadsheet is a measurement of the energy and flow pattern of your circulatory system. Money is just a circulatory system in a business. And you need to monitor what's the oxygenation level of that bloodstream or however you wanna measure it, how easy is it flowing? And if you, can get to the point where you understand that various business tools like spreadsheets are just measuring energy flow in your business, then it becomes a whole different thing. Oh, the energy flowed this way last month and it flowed up and down this way next month, I think maybe, so I can sort of plan around it a bit. And all of a sudden it isn't like numbers and scary and accountants and I hate it, which is how most of us approach in the energy world business tools. Rather, they can be elegant, they can be simple and they can be helpful. And of course, you don't have to be an expert in spreadsheets. To this day, I can't do a damn formula on a spreadsheet, but I sure know how to get people to do the formulas for me so I can use the spreadsheets and understand my, a couple of my businesses. So I'm just using spreadsheets as an example. Take the best out of it. You know, there's lots of good things in all kinds of business practices. They don't have to be infused and controlled by greed or fear. So we take the best out of the capitalistic sort of structure we don't have to dump it all. We use it in the way that serves us well. And if you can start to understand business tools as energy tools, all these other energy healers, then you start to go, wait a minute. Now you're in my wheelhouse. I know about energy. What happens to a lot of people who work with energy, we separate our energy skills from our businesses and somehow it becomes something flat and linear and terrible to have to deal with. And we defeated ourselves right there because then often our businesses are not sustainable. You may have some comments, Jennifer. Um, yeah, so I guess like overall, one of my biggest learning edges was to uh, get my ego out of the business so that I can look at a profit and loss statement, which I do every, you know, every month for quantum touch. And I look at this profit and loss statement and I look at it with an open heart and I look at it. Okay. So where is money flowing? That shouldn't be flowing. Where, where would the business like money to flow differently? I ask the business what the business thinks of its profit and loss statement. And uh, it becomes more of like doing an energy healing on, on the profit and loss statement. And um, I, I have found that to be really effective as to guiding the cash flow for the business. Um, does that make sense or is, does anyone it's like uh, make sense to anyone? An another example, um, maybe on a more personal level that I started doing when I was trying to dig myself out of a uh, major debt was I looked at my own personal bank statement and I looked at it from the eyes of an energy healer rather than the eyes of a person and said, okay, which things feel right and which things feel not in alignment? And I looked at my bank statement and said, oh, well, I can, I can cut this and I can cut this and I can cut this and it'll actually feel better. And that really made an impression on me because it was really about connecting with what's authentic and true for me rather than, oh, I'm a bad person because I overspent or I spent more than I made this month or all those judgments that I got into every time, you know, my bank statement was negative or every time the profit and loss was negative. I, I, I took all that out and said, what's in the highest good? What feels authentic? And ultimately I realized that uh, abundance and money, it, it's really not about abundance, not about a account balance or a lot of money. It, it's really 
a growth tool, you know, a, a spiritual growth tool, like your bank statement can be a tool to help you grow into your authentic self, into your authentic truth. You know, as another example, I'm like, oh, wow, I spent, you know, $500 on clothes this month. Why? Was it really like I wanted more clothes? Was it really authentic for me? Or was I just trying to make an impression? And uh, when I got it, got really real with myself and realized, wow, I have some growth here because I'm still trying to impress others with what I wear or I'm trying to, you know, my, my ego is really involved in this type of stuff. Um, focusing more on, on my own growth and, and being authentic and, and my money started to balance better when I started being more authentic to who I really am instead of who I thought people wanted me to be another childhood script, you know, what do other people think? And uh, money's become a, a spiritual, a tool for spiritual growth, really a tool to help me step into my authentic self. So the irony of it all, it's not even about the money. We're, we're here to grow as spiritual beings. And um, that to me is another reason why I love this topic because ultimately the amount of growth that I've had by trying to balance, you know, my checkbook has been phenomenal. And uh, that's, the, that's the, the, the irony of it all. It's really not about money. Thank you, Jennifer, really well said. We have a few minutes left and I wondered if anybody had a question or comment either in chat or, or raising your hand if your video is on. This actually is a really good question of what I was just talking about. Um, he said, uh, I'm wondering what the speakers think about how one's mastering frugality may lead to lower need and desire for making money. This, this is really interesting. So frugality has always bothered me because it seems like scarcity to me, trying to be frugal. I need to cut back. I can't do what I want. But I have noticed that when I actually come from a place of being authentic, and spending my money in alignment with my truer self, my, my you know, a true self, I end up spending less naturally, not because I'm trying to follow a budget or trying to conform myself in these little boxes, but because when I only buy things that are authentic or that have meaning or that I love, uh, I generally don't, I find that I don't need as much. So that's my response to Michael. Yeah, I think it, in my response is it depends on our attitude. If frugality is shrinking in and, oh my God, scare, fear-based, I don't think it's going to be helpful. But if reasonableness and what you buy and don't buy is a felt sense of, is this going to support my path and my growth? That's a different thing. You know, my watch fell apart the other day. I've had it for years and I was never really happy with it anyway. So I went online and, and I, I was kind of looking for something different, I looked at ceramic watches and I found a wooden watch. I didn't realize there was any such thing as a wooden watch. I love wood, I love trees, and there's this beautiful little watch. It wasn't very expensive, made out of olive wood and sandalwood, and so I bought it. And I'm just really happy because the idea of having a piece of wood on my wrist rather than metal was really appealing to me and more natural and more organic, uh, and, it, and it wasn't very expensive. Um, and so I bought something online. I suppose I could have got my watch repaired one more time because I've done that a few times, but my calling was to look for something that would feel better on my wrist. And of course, give me the time as well. So there's an example of a purchasing choice that was based on feeling and essence rather than on just the mathematics or the practicality. Brad, we're gonna wrap up and I wonder if you wanna make any concluding comments yourself. You're muted. Brad, you're muted. Yeah, yeah sorry about that. Yes, I would. Um... Uh, I appreciate that, Dan. I was uh, just uh, getting uh, ready to send an email out uh, to the entire uh, registration list on the Eventbrite page where you signed up. Uh, you'll have links directly to the Eventbrite uh, sign up for the course series. Uh, there are links in that email to books by both Jennifer and Dan. Uh, if uh, anybody has any questions, uh, my contact information will be in that email. Uh, feel free to reach out to me, uh, you know, 101, I can answer any questions. Uh, and then, again, just to uh, kind of emphasize sort of the, the, the context of that course series, it's going to be a deep dive. There's going to be a lot of interaction, a lot of opportunity to learn from Dan and Jennifer and from, for them to learn from you. As, as Dan said, you know, we are all bringing experience and wisdom uh, into this uh, conversation space. 
Um, and I, I've also provided uh, in that email links directly uh, to Dan's, uh, a book by Dan called Wake Up Curious, and also um, a book by Jennifer called Spiritual and Broke. So you can learn more about that. There's links to the Amazon page where you can purchase those books if you like. Uh, that said, um, we're a couple of minutes from the end here. Uh, so uh, keep your eye out on your email. You will have more information coming in there. And I, I, I'm uh, seeing some some chat light up here. So uh, Dan and Jennifer, is there anything you might want to uh, let me just conclude the uh, the hour with in terms of answering questions or or uh, summarizing uh, what we've learned today or what uh, we will be sort of going into in more depth uh, in the course series. Well, there's a nice comment uh, in chat from Peggy. Thank you, Peggy. I'm looking forward to doing regular energy healings for my business. Exactly right. Peggy got it. That's exactly what we've learned to do is that we shouldn't just be applying our energy skills to our clients, but we are our first client personally and professionally. And if you begin to understand your business as a living entity, you can take all your incredible skills, I'm sure most or all of you have, and apply it. And there's a number of thank yous here. And, you know, it, and somebody else gave a nice definition of frugality that wasn't contracted. So take a look at the chats. But finally, just to say, look, I've discovered for myself, and I know Jennifer has, it is an abundant universe. It truly is. And we hope that we can help you learn how to participate in that. Jennifer, any final Great. comments? Yeah, I, one of the things that uh, Bridget said that uh, just wanted to emphasize uh, is that everything is energy. That's what I've been exploring the last uh, 20 years running Quantum Touch uh, and continue to go deeper into that. It seems like there's no end of learning about how our energy the energy we're projecting, you know, affects our external reality. I find that fascinating because uh, you get constant feedback of, of what you're putting out there. So I look forward to exploring with you all how to, how to work with this energy and apply it to your business and, and finance. And uh, to me, that's, that's uh, really exciting. So thank you all for attending. Thank you, folks. I think we'll wrap up there. Be well, be safe, be abundant.